They come home with honor, with the gratitude of their fellow Americans, and sometimes with life-changing injuries. This morning, we're talking about the challenges faced by wounded soldiers when they return home to civilian life. And we'll see how one group is on a mission to empower disabled veterans and their families. First, we begin with the story of an extraordinary Vietnam vet who is committed to helping a younger generation of veterans. My name is Jim Sersley, and I served in the United States Army as a Staff Sergeant E-6 during the Vietnam conflict. I was in country over there from March of 1968 until my injury on January the 11th, 1969. I stepped on a landmine, estimated to be about 25 pounds of TNT, and it traumatically amputated both of my legs and my left arm. I don't remember the click or the actual event when I detonated the landmine. I, I do remember remaining conscious after I was blown up into the air and came back down on the ground. Um, I laid there and remained conscious and carried on a conversation with our medic, Doc Warwick, before the dust off helicopter came to get me. Jim spent nearly 11 months in the hospital and much longer learning new ways of accomplishing everyday tasks. It's like being born again at the age of 21. And I mean, how you get on and off the commode or take a shower or transfer from your wheelchair to a bed or wheelchair to a car, all those things are a brand new experience. And even though you do them uh, many, many times over and over, you still don't adapt to that until you've probably been doing it for about a two year period of time. Jim went on to run a successful real estate business and raise a family. He's been with his wife, Jeannie, for 25 years. It was a strength, I think, just something about him that I wanted to get to know him. So finally a friend of his said, go ask her out. <laughs> She'll say, I'd never really noticed the wheelchair. It was a personality and an individual that I fell in love with and that individual just happened to ride around or his mode of transportation was a wheelchair. Now that he is retired, Jim enjoys playing with his 10 grandchildren. Probably the most amazing thing with the kids is when, when they were born into a situation where they find grandpa in a wheelchair, it becomes just another toy for them to play with. They turn the rings on my chair, they climb up on the back of it, they crawl over the top of it. Jim also volunteers with Disabled American Veterans, an organization dedicated to helping injured vets and their families. This is how he met Josh Cope, a soldier who lost both legs in Iraq. I got hurt uh, November 13, 2006, around uh, 10.30 in the morning, Baghdad time. I was five minutes from the gate, hit an IED, it's an improvised explosive device, roadside bomb, and uh, killed the gunner, killed the driver, and me, I lost both legs. I told them I was dying, they said, no, you're not. They put tourniquets on my leg, took me back to the aid station, and then got me on the helicopter. Then I was in the uh, green zone, getting surgery within the hour. They call it the golden hour. They get you within surgery within an hour, then they have a higher chance of saving your life. Josh was thankful to return home to his wife and baby girl, but the adjustment hasn't been easy. He says knowing Jim has made a big difference. Jim, I can talk to him like if I have a problem or something. I just like if I don't understand like about a benefit or about like the VA process or something like that, then I just I just call him and ask him a question. And then if he doesn't know the answer, he'll get back with me in a, a, a day or two and t tell me what the answer is. Josh had another baby a year ago, and he's studying criminal justice. As he moves on with his life, he finds inspiration in all that Jim has accomplished. It just gives you hope, you know. I mean. If he can do it, I mean, he has it worse off than me, so I don't, I, don't have, I don't really have an excuse. If you put me behind a screen and you describe my life to a, to a large crowd of people, they'd all be sitting there scratching their head and saying, well, you know what? That sounds like a pretty normal individual that's standing behind the screen. If you lift the screen and there's Jim Sersley missing two legs and an arm, that's truly the nicest thing you could ever say is that I had an opportunity to live a normal life. Unfortunately, though, some veterans' injuries are just so severe, they will require long-term care. And that's a task that typically falls to family members. Army medic Alan Babin was serving in Iraq in 2003. He was shot in the abdomen while rushing to the aid of another wounded soldier. Alan lost 90% of his stomach, uh, his spleen, part of his pancreas. 
survived on the hood of a gun truck for over three and a half hours because they were unable to extract him from the battlefield because the firefight was so severe. During his recovery, Allen developed meningitis and suffered a stroke. His speech and ability to walk remain impaired. I was laid out in a bed for the first seven months after I got back after I received my injury and I haven't given up yet. Alan was not expected to survive, then was expected to be bedridden. And in the last five years, Alan has been doing adaptive skiing and snowmobiling and scuba diving and rock climbing. What uh, Disabled American Veterans has done is allow us to understand um, and focus on Alan's abilities and not his disabilities. I would like just to be like a role model for other injured vets. As far as I'm concerned, the sky's the limit because where Alan is seven years after he was wounded and not expected to survive um, is a testament to what he can do with the rest of his life. The veterans we visited offer proof that even severe disabilities need not stand in the way of a meaningful life. Get out of the house, go to college, get involved in the community, do things in your community, be an inspiration to the young men and women that are coming back and just reach out and live your life. And when we return, Jim Sersley will join us here in the studios to share more of his inspiring story. Stay with us. And welcome back, everybody. Vietnam veteran Jim Sersley is with us this morning in the studio to discuss his mission to improve the lives of disabled veterans. Good morning to you, Jim. Good morning, Danielle. Thanks for having us. And, and I'm glad you are here with us this morning to share your story and talk a little bit more about the DAV. What made you decide to get involved with disabled American veterans? Well, I originally joined the DAV in November of 1970, shortly after I returned from Vietnam. And it just seemed like the natural kind of organization to be involved in because it associated me with fellow disabled veterans that shared some of the same problems and life's difficulties and we could help each other get along and further our, our, uh, our lifestyle. Give me a little more background on the DAV for, for those of our viewers who may not be as familiar with it. Well, the DAV was originated back in the 1920s, uh, over 90 years ago when vets came back from World War I and struggled in their existence to get benefits for their disabilities. And, and that's kind of what took off then was that original group. Putting that together is what's made it so much wonderful for us today. I understand there are more than three million disabled veterans here in the United States. When they do come home, what are, what are some of the issues they deal with, Jim? What are their needs? Well, I think two of the major ones is how to file a claim with the VA health care system, how to obtain all the benefits they've earned in their military service, and then secondly, how they access the VA health care system, because that's something they're going to need for a long, long time. True. And you know what the other thing that I think about is, is when these veterans come home, and you may have experienced this even in your own situation, they come home with their own disabilities, but they come home to families who may not really understand how to deal with it. Well, and some of the things, it may even be more difficult for the family and spouses to, uh, to deal with it because the veteran has got his association and, and his time that he spent in the hospital. He's learned some of those skills, but the family has to learn now, how do I deal with the changes that's happened to this son or daughter and how we're going to live the rest of our life and how we can better assist him. And how difficult was it for you when you came home adjusting? It was extremely difficult because we go back to the late 1960s and early 1970s and you didn't see a lot of people in wheelchairs uh, the Vietnam veteran kind of pushed that into the forefront. And now you see a lot of individuals in college and high school and in employment all across the country. I can remember one time when I first left at Simmons General Hospital in Aurora, Colorado, on my way back to Rochester, Minnesota to travel home on an airplane. And when I got to the airlines, they said, so who's traveling with you? And I said, well, no one's traveling with me. And they said, well, you have to have a chaperone to go with you. We can't let someone like you on the wheelchair on the plane all by yourself. That's certainly changed tremendously because that's not the case anymore today. I think the, the awareness of the American public is huge in, in, uh, in allowing me to be out there and have the freedom to go to college, to gain employment, to be married, have a family, 
participate in the community. And you know what, that sounds like normal things, but that's just exactly what these young men and women want to do when they come back from Iraq or Afghanistan with a disability. What can we do? What can ordinary Americans do to make a difference in the lives of disabled veterans? Well, I think, first of all, for the American public to embrace these young men and women as they come back, to certainly thank them for their service. Obviously, if they're seeking employment, be of whatever assistance you can be. But single, most importantly, as a disabled American veterans, we rely heavily on the generosity of the American public to support our organization so we can reach out to these young men and, men and women and help them in any way that we can. Anything we can do to help, um, certainly we will. And we want to thank you for our service to our country and also thank you for being on the show with us this morning. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Mm, absolutely. And if you'd like to learn more about how you can make a difference in the lives of families like the Babins and the Copes, be sure to visit the Disabled American Veterans Organization online and you'll find that at DAV.org.